so as you role play how God thinks and as his thinking is actually building in your mind unbeknownst to you there's a kind of transformation that takes place that you also don't recognize until it's too late you fall in love with them my pastor spent a lot of time on this and I don't think the congregation ever understood him he kept on trying to explain things in different ways and he picked you know different metaphors and methodologies of explaining the same material and in one of those he was trying to explain about how you fall in love with God you got to fall in love with God or there's no point whatsoever to even being a Christian except to be saved you know, being saved is one thing. That's the floor. That's 1 Corinthians 3. Okay, so whoopee, you're saved now. Now what? You're just supposed to be little Miss Goody Two-Shoes? That's what Christianity thinks it's about. It's not about that at all. In fact, that's actually immoral. Morality can be immoral when it is a substitute for learning God. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did in the Bible. They use their morality and their good deeds as a substitute for having a relationship with God. They wanted to go before God like that, you know, parable between the publican and the Pharisee. And the Pharisee saying, oh God, I'm so thankful to you. I'm not like that publican over there that I'm righteous and he's not. And the publican was going, beating his breast. It was something you did with your right hand, you form the V with your right hand, and you hit your upper left shoulder. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. That was not invented by the Roman church. That was a, a thing that the, they did in Roman military. Okay? It was called beating your breast. It was a sort of ritual that the soldiers went through. Okay, it was a kind of salute, really. And Christ said to the onlookers, you know what, the publican went away justified, but not the Pharisee. Do you fall in love with God? You know you're on the right track in the spiritual life, and it feels terrible, okay? When you can't get enough Bible, because it's about Him. And you actually start having problems living a normal life because all you want is more Bible and more Him. You, you have to start having trouble, you know, um, managing your day. Everything starts to fall by the wayside. You, can be, you have bouts where you're completely disorganized because you're spending all these hours on Bible study. It's a bad habit to get into, but it's inevitable. It's whenever you fall in love, this is what happens. And of course you hate yourself and you're no good and God is gorgeous, but it's Him now. Personal. And He's not going to let it sit there. It's the anchor. It's the thing that keeps you steady and keeps you going. Second Corinthians 5.14 He just threw that in my mind. The love for Christ, suneco, it's translated compels. That's some dippy, carnal Christian translating it that way. It's not compels. Suneco means hold you together. Sun means together. Echo means to grasp, to hold. And therefore it comes to mean to have. But have is not is not remotely the idea. It's it's the thing it's like putting your arms around you and, and holding you together as a person. The love for him is going to hold you together through all the rest. And he's going to take you on this journey from the time you fall in love with him onward. And it hurts all the time. It feels great at other times. It's this whole gamut of emotions. Emotions is just how your body's reacting to the information. Emotions are never spiritual. Your human nature can't take this. So you're going to have positive and negative emotions and you're going to feel crappy all the time and you're going to think you're a sinner and blah, blah, blah because you have all these strong feelings. Okay, but that's 
there's nothing wrong with having those feelings. That's the most important thing I want to get out of this audio. Is that he takes you, he, he starts, you fall in love with him. That becomes your anchor. And then from there, he takes you on this round robin journey of high and low experience so that you learn to love righteousness too. And it's really important because when you fall in love with him, everything else in your life becomes just flat, pointless. Not worth your time. You start to see the world for what it is. Tawdry, stupid, small, shallow, you know, attention span of five seconds. No desire really to know God. God is mouthed all the time by Christians, but they don't care about him at all. He's just a designer label that they can slap on their own egos for what they do. And you begin to see all that and it hurts. Why? Because he's teaching you to love righteousness. Righteousness is not what Christianity thinks. It's way higher. And the human body can't take it. You begin to actually become addicted to it. So... It, the things that you used to enjoy, you stop enjoying because they're just not attractive enough anymore. And the things that you used to hate, you start finding yourself wanting to do. It's almost like you can't be satisfied unless you do the thing you hate because it's right. It's always based on intrinsics, not because you hate it or because you like it. You'll be confused about that for a long time. It's always, what is right about this? What is wrong about this? Remember, I've said this many times now. What's good about it? What's bad about it? Applied to breakfast. I've used that example several times. And it's the intrinsics. And he's weaning you off of the good, bad, self-image, ego, the constant insecurity you feel because he's gorgeous and you're not and you're in love with him. So your own sense of inadequacy is heightened. He's weaning you off that. Stay with the intrinsics. What's good about this? What's bad about this? Because he wants you to see why he loves righteousness. But we're so permeated with the sin nature, we're constantly thinking, I've got to be a good person. I'm a bad person. I'm a good person. I'm a bad person. I'm a good person if I do this. I'm a bad person if I do that. And he's got to wean you off of all of that. In other words, when you're picking the food for breakfast, it's not to be a good person or to even get it right. It's because the intrinsics of the answer are so gorgeous. Even breakfast. The intrinsics about right versus wrong are gorgeous. Tasty. His own satisfaction in the right answer is because it's tastier than all other answers. And he's, he, you know, he's using your love for him to keep giving you, you know, lessons. You're using the Bible as usual, living and learning on Bible, using with John 1 9 almost constantly, or you'll feel you need it constantly. And then he takes you through one experience or the next, okay, some of which are starting to become kind of weird now because you've fallen in love with him and you can afford to get the weird stuff. You're in spiritual adulthood at that point. That's defined as falling in love with God. Most Christians never even know what that is. It is not an emotion. It's a focus. And then he takes you through so that you actually start to fall in love with righteousness also. And, and the thing that I need to stress about that is that once this happens to you, you are never going to be happy with anything else. And it's really hard for me to, to live with this. It, it, it's like... He's, he's taking you to this goal because it's like a cross. It's the same life that Christ went through. It's the same path he went through. Is that, you know, Christ was always going toward the cross, training for the cross. Well, what is that? It's training for something that you don't want. And yet you don't want to live without if you don't do it. It's the merging of dream come true and nightmare. Because of the intrinsics, the characteristics of the thing you're going toward. Not because it's good, not because you're a hero, even though you are. And you'll always feel like a rat, not a hero. Not because, you know, you're saving the world, which is happening, but 
it doesn't seem like it. Because after all, God's doing all that, really. It's going to be based on the characteristics of the thing he's leading you to. The innate characteristics of the thing. And, and, and you know, I can't speak for what your biggest nightmare is, but my biggest nightmare is this whole king thing. Having somebody look at me and pay attention to me. I want to just be alone where nobody ever knew who I was on a desert island with my Bible books and, you know, be. This whole public person thing drives me nuts. So, you know, I make audios and videos kind of to train in it, get used to it. Because the other side of me wants to do this thing. Why? Because it's my destiny. So your dream come true and your worst nightmare are truly in your own head of your own choosing. Okay, but they reflect, they reflect God's plan for your life. Because don't you think he knows what your dream come true and worst nightmare are from eternity past? God doesn't shackle us. He fulfills us. So that's part of my personality. On the one hand, I wish that I never saw a living person. No offense. And I could just be alone. And on the other hand, I feel this terrific need to be a public person because I want to help people. Okay, but you can't help people. They don't want to be helped. They call for help, and they want goodies, and they want gimmies. But you know what they really don't want? They don't want to be, how do you want to call it, fixed or helped. They want to fancy that they did it themselves. They want to take something from you, but they don't want to get something from you. It's a really big difference. People want to feel like they tricked you into giving them something. But if you genuinely give it because you want to, well, they can't take that. To them, that's an insult. And Satan's big problem with God. Giving it for free or getting it for free, nobody values. Because people don't really want love. They want conquering. They want achievement. The good deeds, sin, nature, that's really the essence of it, can't handle love. Just can't. So God is teaching you that love. And it's for righteousness, just for the intrinsic quality of the thing, which happens to be your worst nightmare and your dream come true, and he merges them. And you actually become so addicted to real righteousness, God's level righteousness, then nothing else is going to make you happy. And you'll run from it. And you'll run to it. You'll have go back and forth. That's Romans 7. Okay? That's what Paul's describing. Back and forth. Back and forth. Here I know this thing is good. I believe in it. I love it. And then I see myself doing this other thing. See, Paul's explaining. You can't be happy. It's not about it's not about goody two shoes. It's about desire at this point. It's long since past the whole goody two shoes thing. But you'll keep phrasing it in terms of goody two shoes. You'll keep phrasing it in terms of I ought to do this, I shouldn't do that, I'm bad here, I'm good here. You'll keep on using those phrases. But down deep in your soul what's happened instead? It's just you need to go after what's good and right. You need it. And it isn't to make yourself feel good about yourself anymore. It's because you just love it. And it, it, it took a long time to wake up to this. Okay? For the longest time I kept telling myself how bad I was. Okay, and there's this violent reaction that goes on, you know, because when you tell yourself you're bad, you know, the psychological defense mechanisms kick in and then you either sublimate or you deny it. You know, you might sit down and watch TV for 48 hours so you can escape or go to a bar or whatever people you do to escape. Every one of us has our own favorite habits. They're all just as destructive. 
Okay. Or there's denial. Or there's sub that sublimation I was just talking about, you know, with the going to a bar, watching TV for a long time. Anything to get your mind off the fact that, you know what, if you don't go toward that thing that you know is right, that you actually want to do, but it bothers you all at the same time because that's the sin nature kicking, you're, you're not going to be happy unless you go after it. So it stops being about, oh, I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. And it starts being about, I want this thing as much as I hate it. Your dream come true and your worst nightmare emerging. Now, I've talked about that a little bit before, but this is yet another role play. Is to sit down with yourself, as it were, talking to God, of course. Otherwise, you'll never be able to sort it out. And say, what is my dream come true and what is my worst nightmare? Because that will be the path he's leading you on. To merge the two. You know, like Moses' dream come true was to save Israel. But his worst nightmare was to lead them. Well, you can't save them if you don't lead them. You know, Gideon's worst nightmare was to come out of obscurity and lead the troops. And his dream come true, of course, was to do the same thing. And he, he didn't weather it. Gideon didn't weather it. He ended up tanking spiritually. It's really sad how his story ended. David's dream come true was to, you know, know God. And his worst nightmare was to have to be a king. So God gave him the Worst nightmare news early. <laughs> okay, so you role play your worst nightmare and your dream come true, and then the other thing you want to role play is when I get all hung up on something that's right, why is that? Look at the look at the intrinsics of the issue. Why am I, am I attracted to it, or am I just doing it because I've heard, you know, it's hearsay amongst my peers, and they say I'm supposed to want this thing, and that this is righteous. What are, you, what are your own motives? Because you're going to find out that a whole lot of people's motives in life are stemming from a false idea about what is good and bad, a false idea about what is right and wrong. And those things aren't fulfilling. But they go after them because they're like, you know, little hamsters in a treadmill. We've been told, we've been told, we've been told. We've been told it's important to be pretty. We've been told it's important to be handsome. We've been told it's important to be rich. We've been told it's important to be healthy. We've been told, we've been told it's important to have a status job. Okay, but you know what? Those things aren't true. They're not. Some people, you give them a lot of money, that's not going to make them happy. First, they're not going to know what to do with it. And frankly, money brings a whole lot of problems with it. Other people, and I know this one from experience, there's no, there's no extra happiness that comes from being physically attractive. It creates a whole lot of problems. I mean, you know, in... Middle Ages and before, one of the things that pretty women used to do was disfigure themselves so they wouldn't be raped. There's a lot of pain that goes with being attractive physically, a great deal of pain. You know, and people who are plain physically, they're always, well, not always, but often jealous of those who are attractive physically, thinking, Oh, gee, that person has a better or happier life than I do. They get all the fun, and here I am, and nobody notices me. Honey, you, you're, you don't know how well off you are. It's better that people don't notice you, because when they notice you, you know what they do? They beat you up, sometimes literally. Best thing in the world is to be anonymous and nobody can see you. Because the human race, they don't know how to express attraction. They don't know how to express, you know, how do you want to call it, what they think is love. 
what they think is love translates into them beating on you, beating on you, beating on you, talking, beating on you, and getting all ticked off if you don't, you know, how do you want to call it, respond the way they think you should respond. They act crazy, they do crazy things, they're trying to get your attention, and they fantasize something in your head that's not even there. And you don't have any freedom. You wish you could just cover your head up so nobody could see you and act like that. The same thing with money, anything that attracts attention. Okay? Those things don't make people happy. What makes a person happy, and I don't know quite why this is true, it must be something God designed, it makes you happy if you face issues that bother you and go through them, whether you fail or succeed. And it's even, and the thing that's really the most fulfilling thing in life is to go through something that really taps you, that taxes you out, all the way to the bottom where, you know, you think, well, one more step and I'm dead, baby. It takes you all the way to the bottom of your own soul. And you can't go one inch farther. And you feel, of course, usually guilty that you can't. You're always thinking you didn't do well enough. But the truth is, is you were at the bottom. There's just nowhere else to go. And then later on, you realize how much you went through. Even if you were an idiot, even if you failed at whatever it was you thought you were supposed to get through. Just going through it. And the same is true at the high end. Going through some high prosperity that just taps you out that way. It's high to low. High low. That's what I call it. He's sending you on the high low. So that you learn the intrinsics and learn to get past, oh, how good I am, how bad I am, how well I'm producing, how bad I'm producing, how well I'm performing, how bad I'm performing. And yet at all points, this is a performance game, this experience. And yet it's not about performance. It's just about learning the intrinsics of the experience so you get to see it through God's eyes. So you become addicted to righteousness the way God is, as it were, voluntarily addicted to it. And once you get there, it wouldn't matter if the right thing bought you anything or not. It wouldn't even matter if you succeeded at it or not. you got to go for it just because. And that's when you're thinking like he does. It won't feel like that. But that's what it is. And the only thing that ever makes a person happy who knows him is to go after the same goals, even constantly failing. The goal is there. Katas kopon dioko, Philippians 3.14. Just because that's the process. You're addicted to the process like God is. If the goal is there to be had, so you go. And you fall and you go. It's Hamburger Hill and you go up one more step. Because you know what? You're not happy if you don't go up that step. Even if you fall down. It's your worst nightmare and your dream come true merged. That's the cross. And that's what Rhodey takes you on so that you get to see the intrinsics for what they are and you understand why he's, as it were, in love with righteousness, justice, and truth. And it's all full spectrum, every single one of those three things. And then you have the love for Christ that goes beyond you know, mere academic understanding. Ephesians 3.15-19 through 19. And it don't feel good. Your body can't take this. Your body can't, doesn't know what to do with. You'll just feel like, you know, you're exhausted and tired all the time and no good. And the opposite is actually true. Because you're willing to go up the hill one more time even though you're slipping in the mud. And that's all you ever want to do. You're like Sisyphus. You roll up the hill only to go back down again. But there's an intrinsic reason to keep rolling that stone and nothing else is going to make you happy but to roll stone 
So role play what those ideas are with God, because for me, they're, you know, the actual specifics are different than for you. But the pattern I've just described to you is the same for all of us. And the weirdness of it is, is that the only happiness is there. You'll know it when you get there. Peace out.